On the 10th of February 2009, the citizens of Kentucky heard a sonic boom in the sky. Something absolutely devastating had just happened in space. An active American satellite Iridium-33 was traveling at an insane speed of 11,700 meters per second when it collided and crashed into Cosmos 2251, a dead Russian satellite. The fallout was devastating and immediate. No one expected this to happen, because the chances of two satellites colliding in space were incredibly low, as low as 1 in 50 million. Times have changed since then, with almost 5,000 active satellites currently in orbit. The task of ensuring that these satellites don't crash into each other has become increasingly complex. However, we haven't had a crash since 2009, so they must be doing something right, right? Welcome to Future Mission. Join us today as we explore the activities of satellites in space, why they don't collide as often as they should, and who pushes the buttons that ensure Earth's orbit doesn't light up like it's the 4th of July. On a very basic level, our world is either of two things, land or water. Land makes up 21% of the Earth's surface and water takes up the remaining 71%. However, the sky that wraps itself around the entire Earth does not have any of those demarcations. It is all space, free for us to explore, as long as we have the tools and equipment to do so. Another thing it has that both the land and sea have is depth. The sea reaches depths of over 11,000 meters in the Mariana Trench. Our land itself goes even deeper, and the furthest we have ever dug is 12,000 kilometers. Our orbital sky, the parts of the Earth's atmosphere still bound by its gravity, is 1.5 kilometers in radius. The sheer scale of it is unfathomable. This is where our rockets orbit, before we send them into deep space. And this is where our satellites reside, as they move at speeds of about 7,000 miles per hour around the Earth. To put things in context, an average bullet moves at a speed of 1,700 miles per hour. This means that satellites orbit at four times the speed of an average bullet in motion. This unbelievable speed also means that satellites can make a complete revolution around the Earth in 24 hours, and anything that comes in its way will be eviscerated, man or object. Thankfully, no human being has had the unfortunate opportunity of crashing into any satellites. And ever since the Iridium Cosmos collision, we haven't had another incident of that nature. But that doesn't mean that a collision can never happen. At the beginning of this video, we spoke about how slim the chances of collision are for two satellites in orbit, but there are several types of collisions that can happen. There is the natural satellite collision, which is when the moons of a planet crash into each other. It is extremely unlikely, but not completely impossible. Astrophysicists say this phenomenon happens constantly in the rings of Saturn. However, we have only one moon, so we know that the chances of that happening anywhere near Earth is zero. There is the artificial satellite collision, which is when man-made satellites crash into each other and break into pieces. We spoke about the only occurrence of this earlier. A variant of this type of collision happens when countries like China and Russia decide to willfully blow up their satellites when they are no longer in use, which they have done in the past, not once, and definitely not twice because the problem with destroying satellites had little to do with the explosions and everything to do with whatever is left of the satellites after the collision or destruction. Space debris. This word sounds like an intergalactic nightclub for Peter Quill and his gang of galaxy guardians, but believe me when I say, it is the furthest thing from that description. Space debris are shrapnels, thousands of broken, scattered bits of satellites that survive the destruction or collision of their former state. Now, no one would have a problem with the debris if it was just floating around in space, like Sandra Bullock in the movie Gravity. It would be easier to evade and possibly retrieve the debris if that was the case. But they don't float. They move at neck-breaking speeds. At the moment, there are over 20,000 known and tracked pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth, with every one of them traveling at an average speed of about 15,000 miles per hour. In other words, these pieces of debris are moving faster than the satellites themselves. If you are asking why or how this is even possible, then you might just have to blame the laws of physics and whoever caused the collision or destruction of the satellites. Because when these explosions happen, the satellites destroy outwards and the shrapnel, debris, move at the sustained speed of the outward force that sets them running. Okay, let's move on. This is a little off topic, but 
Since we are here already, we cannot miss the opportunity to point out one of the most ridiculous points in American space history. We might have been a little unfair to Russia and China, because they are not the only cause of debris in space. The US military also had a huge part to play in messing up space, and it happened during the Cold War, at the height of military arrogance and ignorance. In the early 1960s, the US military wanted to devise a new way of communicating with its forces around the globe. At the time, they were using undersea cables. They feared that their cables could easily be cut into shreds by the enemy, which would destroy their chances of winning the war. So what was their solution? Well, they initiated a program called Project Westford, which involved launching 480 million tiny silver needles into space, which would give Earth an artificial ionosphere that they could reliably bounce radio signals from and communicate to any casual astronomy enthusiast in the 21st century. This idea sounds incredibly stupid, and back then, scientists from Russia, Britain, the United Nations, and even within the US complained about the long-term implications of this mission, but they didn't listen. 480 million needles were deployed into space and today, over 50 years after the questionable mission, there are still 36 clumps of needles dirtying Earth's orbit. So let's get the real question off the table. With all these things littering the orbital space, how have satellites managed to avoid getting hit? They haven't. At least, not every time. Even the ISS has suffered an assault by space debris. However, there have been serious efforts to ensure that these events are reduced to a minimum and that satellites do not collide with anything under any circumstance. This is how it has been achieved. Functioning satellites are equipped with maneuvering thrusters before they are launched so they can be moved to a different orbit if a piece of space debris is known to be heading their way. But with tens of thousands of objects large enough to cause serious problems in orbit, ranging in size from 0.4 inches, 1 centimeter, to 80 feet, 25 meters, it's no easy task to keep track of them all. This is where the space surveillance and tracking segment of ESA's Space Situational Awareness Program comes in. They employ a network of telescopes, radars, and laser ranging stations to detect and track objects, and then process the resulting data. At ESA Mission Control in Darmstadt, Germany, Mission Control will then issue an alert if evasive action is deemed necessary. This system works well at the moment, and as technology advances, the hope is that computers will be more precise at detecting and tracking objects in space. The number of new satellites being launched is higher than it has ever been. Elon Musk alone has plans of launching 48,000 satellites. He has already launched 1,800 into space, and he has the authorization to launch 2,000 more. The major concern is not tracking satellites and debris. It is what will happen when the fragmentary objects, generated from the ongoing collisions, reach a tipping point. This situation is called the Kessler Syndrome, and if we ever reach that point, then our satellites will be rendered useless. Space activities will be very difficult, and it will cause real-time consequences here on Earth. At this point, why hasn't anyone cleaned up the debris yet? It's not for lack of trying. Some scientists have suggested giant lasers. We would use high-powered pulsed lasers based on Earth to create plasma jets on space debris that would cause them to slow down slightly, and then to re-enter and either burn up in the atmosphere or fall into the oceans. The only problem is that we would be solving one problem while creating another, adding more garbage in the oceans. Another idea that a scientist came up with sounds like it fell off the pages of a Hollywood sci-fi script. James Holopeter of GIT Satellite proposed launching rockets full of water into space. The rockets would release their payload to create a wall of water that orbiting junk would bump into, slow down, and fall out of orbit. For some reasons known to NASA and the entire space community, no one has acted on the idea. Maybe it's because they are more enthusiastic about their project. A project that they have been working on with the US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA. It is called Electrodynamic Debris Eliminator, or EDI, another name that sounds like a Transformers character. The EDI is essentially a space garbage truck, equipped with 200 giant nets that could be extended out to scoop up space garbage. The EDI would then either fling the garbage back to Earth to land in the oceans, or push the objects into a closer orbit, which would keep them out of the way of current satellites until they decay and fall back to Earth. Whatever method the space agencies choose is welcome. At this point, any help 
is welcome. Earth's orbit is getting increasingly cluttered on a daily basis, and if we are not careful, our orbital space will experience the Kessler effect. Our satellites will be destroyed by debris. Communications on Earth will go offline. Say goodbye to your beloved internet. You won't even be able to access your ATM. The stakes are incredibly high, and most people have no idea the threat our civilization faces. If all the satellites in the world were destroyed this minute, we would be plunged into a dark age that could lead to a global state of anarchy. Are we overreacting? Well, we can only hope that we never have to find out.